Hello, and welcome to the Inspired Living with Ellen Broderick podcast. My guest today is Dr. Clark Mitchell. Dr. Jean Clark Mitchell is a multicultural, multi-ethnic psychotherapist practicing psychodynamic psychotherapy, as well as DBT and CBT and other forms of evidence-based therapy. She holds a master's of social work and a PhD in social work from Smith College School of Social Work and holds expert status in the areas of intimate partner violence tra and trauma in, uh, and its effect on families. For nearly 15 years, Dr. Clark Mitchell was the clinical director of the Elizabeth Freeman Center, a domestic and sexual violence service agency that centers their work on trauma and advocacy work with survivors in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. She is a clinician and a clinical supervisor at the Breen Center for Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, and she has a private practice and consulting service in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts. Dr. Clark Mitchell is an associate professor of social work at Lesley College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is an adjunct faculty at Cambridge College and at the Lady of the Elms College in Chicopee, Mass. In her teaching, she continues to develop effective social work practitioners. In addition to this work, she has worked with groups in South Africa and done presentations on domestic violence and self-care in Jamaica. Dr. Clark Mitchell serves on the board of directors for the Rockford Moving Forward for the Mass College of Liberal Arts and Western Massachusetts and Albany Association for Psychoanalytic Psychology, and is on the leadership committee of the Massachusetts Women of Color Network. As well, she is a mentor with the Rites of Passage Empowerment, a mentorship program helping adolescent girls to develop their voices and their inner lives. Welcome, Dr. Clark Mitchell. Thank you. I'm so um, excited to be here with you today. It's really a pleasure to have you here. So um, I mentioned to you just before we started that as I was putting this together, I, I've always admired you and known that you were a, um, a very uh, involved and, and busy person, but on with issues that really mean a lot to you. And, um, but as I was putting it together, I thought, my goodness, she has really, been involved in so much important work in, in Western Massachusetts and the Boston, Massachusetts area. So first I wanna say thank you for all of that. You're welcome. Yeah. My passion. And what's that? It's my passion. Yes, yeah. Be a I, helper. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me something about, uh, you know, who your influencers were, especially people who uh, gave you, um, an understanding of the value of education and um, of um, of pursuing your own passions, who those people were and how they influenced you? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, early influencers were my parents, actually. Um, my father was someone who um, was completely literate, I must say. He, he only signed his name for the 42 years, he had the same job. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and but always pushed education. She always had a book in her hand. And so um, to this day, I just rather a hard copy than, <laughs> than using the internet. Mm -hmm. So those are my early influences. But going to school and having people tell you that you're a smart little girl, mm -hmm. you know, that you can do things. And as far as like being um, influenced by helpers, um, I had early influencers of like my Bible school teacher, um, people like that who always try to tell you you can do something for someone else, no matter how small it is, that you can help someone in some way. And then as I got older, um, I immigrated from Jamaica to this country in my early 20s, um, exactly 20, <laughs> and um, started going to school. And I remember um, going to BCC and one of my um, Professor Stacey Evans Let me said, just say, "BCC is Berkshire Community College, right? Yes, here in Berkshire." And my professor Stacey Evans saying, "You know, I think you should go to Brandeis and get a PhD." And I'm like, "Huh? What? Kind of like who?" So anyway, you know, the seed was planted, and um, I'd actually gone to BCC to study psychology, and then I learned about the English Poor Laws 
and some issues around poverty in our own country. And I said, oh, I want to be a social worker. Mm -hmm. So off I went to Mass College of Liberal Arts and, and MCLA. And there I um, studied um, social work and met another professor, Peggy Brooks, who said, you should get a PhD. And so I said, okay, I don't think I can do that right now because I am a single mom and I don't want to go away from my two daughters, Marsha and Marisha. So I decided to go to Smith and um, get an MSW so I could get a job right away. And then, um, yeah, so those are my first, my big influencers. So people stand out while I was there, people um, like Peggy, um, Deborah Foss, um, people like that who just kind of like, show me that they have faith in me. Uh, Francis Jones Sneed um, was one of the first person who said, you know, you're an excellent student and you're gonna do well. So those seeds were planted by those people and I, I just kind of pick it up and follow with it. And, and Francis is, or was a, a history professor at MCLA, right? At Mass College of it's Liberal right. Arts. Yeah. And, and also very involved in um, bringing the stories of um, um, black elders in the Berkshires into um, be recorded and shared in um, really significant ways. And One of the things that she did while I was at MCLA was to take us to um, a place in New York where they had a, a museum about women. Um, um, oh my God, how can I think of Anthony? Um, Oh, Susan B. Anthony? Susan B. Anthony was um, one of the bigger influencers back in the day. And the woman's rights of, um, woman's rights uh, was all written out, you know, for us to see and be influenced by. And I thought, okay, um, yeah, we, we do make a difference. And I want to be one of those women who make a difference. I literally just found Susan B. Anthony's home coming from a, a meeting last month. Yeah, in July, I think it was. Um, and I'm like, I turn the car around. I'm like, this is where, <laughs> this is where Susan B. Anthony grew up. And I had not known, but I had gone to uh, Seneca Falls, um, is where the museum is, and and just was so influenced by that. And that I always think of that when I think of that, I think of Francis Jones Sneed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that Susan B. Anthony also had a um, a connection with either Adams or North Adams. So. Um, yes, sure yes, this place is an Adam. Yeah. yeah, it's an Adams. But I typically go the, the not the back way, mm -hmm. and it's the back way into North Adams that I found that homestead. Incredible. Um, so, so uh, you had connected with, um, and that's uh, Do Dr. Francis uh, Jones Sneed up at mm -hmm. MCLA, and um, and and I think you you still keep up with her. Yes, I get to see her often. Um, she's in the NWACP. She's doing a lot of um, research on underground railroad and some of the other stuff that has to do with um, they're putting together that Web Du Bois Museum. I don't know how involved she's with that on a day to day basis, but um, this lots of historical work um, is being done and other works to help our community of color in the Berkshire and particularly the Black community. I think she also was one of the instrumental people with the um, Samuel um, Harrison Harrison uh, House and Museum uh, yeah. in Pittsfield. In Pittsfield. That is Pittsfield. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, Samuel Harrison was one uh, was the um, uh, the minister to the Massachusetts um, uh, uh, all black. Uh, regiment that went down to um, Georgia, I believe it was South Carolina and Georgia, um, and and fought very valiantly during the Civil War. Um, yeah. the, during was it the Civil War? Yes, the Civil War. Amazing human beings, yeah, that are right here in our backyard. Yeah, and one of the things that he had done um, was to really fight for uh, equal pay for the black soldiers. Um, very important. Very important work. Amazing role models. Can you do you have um any anything to share any story about your own um, immigration and uh you know what what spurred it on and or 
um, you know, what it was like for you to, to leave one culture and come into a completely different culture. Yes, um, my immigration <laughs> process um, began with my sister, um, my older sister coming to America to do some of the, um, a lot of people are immigrated into the country, emigrated into the country to do domestic work. Mm -hmm. And so my sister came in 68. And then she, after getting herself settled, she um, had my mom come to America and having four um, young young children, young adolescents. We were all in the adolescents by then. My mom was able to also get us into the country. So that's how that started. Mm -hmm. And um, coming to America and recognizing all the opportunities for, for us, I went to um, Springfield Technical Community College is where I started. And, um, you know, just getting acclimated to an a, a country that is so different you hear the first black this and that and you're like well all the judges and all the lawyers and everybody's important in my country is black so it's like what is this all about and then you slowly you begin to learn the history of slavery and what that entails and how that has affected um, people of color so then you begin to your antennas go up to like okay every situation what might be going on here the parallel process is that there's still opportunities and you're trying to take those opportunities and and you don't know everything you don't know all of it um, but you're beginning to realize that because of your skin color you might be treated differently and oftentimes you are treated differently but in those contexts you don't really know because your, your antennas are not up around that. So um, I took what opportunities I could. I came and I, I had to do the um, high school equivalency test and I was able to pass that and then um, started college and went from Springfield Technical Community College. Then I went to um, Lowell. It was just U Lowell at the time. Now it's UMass Lowell and matriculated with a degree in business. And one year from an MBA, and then I got married, had kids, and decided that um, mm, I'm, I'm not so into that. My passion isn't that. So when I came to the Berkshires, I started over doing some helping work by um, taking the hotline training at the Elizabeth Freeman Center and did that, was with them for 26 years altogether. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize you had started on the hotline there. And and the hotline is for people who are experiencing domestic violence or um... sexual assault, um, being sexually assaulted. Yeah, I actually came to the Berkshires as a woman who fled my abusive relationship and had services at the Elizabeth Freeman Center. So while in the shelter, um, I took the hotline training, which was never done before. And so they decided that, you know, if you're in the shelter, most likely you're traumatized and you shouldn't be taking that, you know, step, but there was no policy. So afterwards they decided there needs to be some time between when you leave the shelter and then when you're actually being trained to become a counselor. So anyway, um, that worked out and I stayed and, and stayed and just kept going to school and just staying until I actually left last year when I secured the position as an assistant um, professor at, at mm -hmm. and you you ended up being the uh, the the director of the Elizabeth Freeman Center for the clinical director. Clinical director. So yeah. it's, uh, there's the executive director, myself, and the program director, lateral, and then um, the shelter director, mm -hmm. and the, those people form the administrative team, mm -hmm. and then yeah, so yeah. So I also was interested in, in terms of this sort of um, focus and your passion that you had written a paper um, on uh, the qualitative study of black mother-daughter relationship and lessons learned about self-esteem, coping and resilience. So um, I wondered if you could tell us what some of the lessons learned were. It sounded as though there were um, a, a study of a little under 20 people that um, that the information was gleaned from um, that you brought forth in the study. Am I right about that? I'm, I'm remembering 25, but it was the paper I wrote as my comprehensive examination for my dissert for my um PhD program, which is something, a qualifier for you to then 
start the dissertation process, of, you know. Um, so, so I did that study with um, another um, PhD student and our advisor, um, Joyce Everett, Dr. Joyce Everett. And um, what we found was that, yes, African-American mothers and daughters um, have relationships that can be complex, that are complex. And in many ways, we were looking to see what, how um, their self-esteem and resiliency was. And I found that, that there is a lot of resiliency um, when supports are put in place to um, help both parents, both um, parties, that would be the parent and the daughter. And I found that um, I was lucky to interview a couple mother and daughter within that, but it wasn't all of them. And I, I, yeah, I remember more like in, in the 20, 23 or 25. So anyway, um, yeah, we found that there is, and what strengthens that? So a lot of African-American mothers and daughter, um, mothers are grown up in the church. The church becomes a very big, spirituality is a bit, very big part of what brings resiliency, the self, of, the sense of the self-esteem. And um, so we um, also found that um, there are difficulties in that sometimes um, daughters are raised by grandmothers, other mothers, um, so to speak, um, if there is any kind of, um, some of them, some of the people that I interview had left the South to come North, just like we did leave in Jamaica to come to America to, and that has affect the relationship with them at some point because they're more attached. If we listen to Oprah and some of the other people that we, we know, just there's a, a more of a bond with the grandmother. Mm -hmm. So that has um, some effect as well. But in general, that we found that they, um, self esteem can be high with support. And so also resiliency can be high with support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so and, and, and in high. terms of supports, this, this brings me to um, the rope, the uh, uh, rights of um, passage and passage empowerment, program. And empowerment um, program that you are a mentor for. Can you tell us a little bit about that program, how you got involved in it and the kind of work that um, it provides in supporting young uh, women of color as they are coming of age to believe in themselves, have, have a good sense of self and self-esteem? Yes, gladly. That's one of my passion within passion over passion. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the Rest of Passage Empowerment Program is a program that was put together by Shirley, Dr. Shirley Edgerton, mm -hmm. and um, which is another influencer for me, even at my age, um, she is. And she, you know, she had a, a, a program for um, doing step dances. And, and within that program called Youth Alive, she recognized that many of the girls um, needed some some more supports. Mm -hmm. And so she put this um, program together and um, it helps with just bringing young women of color um, into woman, what, womanhood and helping them in that, in ways of academics, um, at living, um, you know, being role models to them and showing them how to become women in society who are also reaching back and giving to society. So a big part of our program is around gratitude and helping others. Um, within the program, um, we um, we have monthly meetings and um, every year we take them to the historically black colleges and university. We, we have a region that we go to and we see as many schools as we can. And then every other year we do a service learning program, which so far has always been on the continent of Africa. So um, we all we are interested in other places, but we have not done that with a, a kind of focus on Africa, which has been very good because African-American um, women in this country have not been taught enough about a, a certain pride in themselves, the beauty about themselves, their intelligence, their black excellence is, is not has been um, supported and fostered in the bigger, larger community. So we wanted to show them. And at the same time, we wanted to do what we do and our mission is helping others. So we always try to find a, an orphanage or school or someplace that we can do go and do some work. And so they can give back while they get to learn the culture about the, the place that we're 
So that has been um, very, very exciting. And also just recognizing that the majority of the, like 90 something percent of the students that we um, call, um, cultivate and develop in the program end up going to college and they end up going to the major colleges. 90 something percent of all our students, like, um, well, we don't have a lot of students that end up not going to college. And they've gone to, you know, Howard University, A&T, you know, some of the Morgan State, some of the other major HBCUs. And so it, it's encouraging and it's just exciting to just be a role model, be a presence, show that, you know, this is possible. And even for the mentors, you know, I started um, in 2014, when they returned from the from the first Ghana trip, and they had a presentation for the community, and they had dancing, and they had food, and everything, and I'm like, I was so amazed. So Shirley was standing over to the side, and I went over, and I, and I just tapped her and said, you know, I want to be a part of this, and she's like, you do? Come on in, you know, and that's how I started, and I can't imagine not being a part of you know, I, I was at that. I was at that event as well. You were at the church on um, Fen Street. Yes. 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 And uh, the presentation of of the girls who had been in Accra, Ghana, mm -hmm. the capital of Ghana, yeah. and uh, all that they shared when they got back. And the, um, th I think there were two events. One was prior to them going. There was a fundraiser, and then one mm -hmm. was when they got back and they could share, you know, stories and 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 pictures and um and experiences it was really yes. exciting um, really really exciting so among as well as being a mentor I'm also the family engagement person so whenever somebody needs an application or I need to connect with their family and you know keep that that liaison um relationship going um I'm, I'm big on that as well I'm curious if, like you had said that, um, you know, you had used the um, the services at Elizabeth Freeman, and then you became uh, a person who um, answered the phone, the emergency right. phone, yeah. et cetera. Are there girls who have been through this program who are now, because I know it's been going for about 10 or 12 years, right? Yeah. Now, like that. Yes, we have. We have young ladies who have gone to college in return and are now alums or also mentors. Yeah. So we, we have Anita, Accor, I think Accor is her last name, and she is now a mentor and she's the assistant manager at the Pittsfield Airport. Mm -hmm. And um, we have um, other um, alums who have come back and done things um, within the community. And then we're now sh starting an alumni chapter so that even when they go off to college, we can still be connecting with them and then they can come back. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's cyclical, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful program. I've known a couple of girls who have gone through it and, mm -hmm. um, and, and witnessed at a little distance um, just a transformation for them in terms mm -hmm. of their uh, feeling like um, I can do it, I can do what I really am here to do. I can really do this. Yeah. Um, and I think that really comes from the kind of support that they feel from, uh, well, it, for, in some cases from their families, um, but this additional community support, you know, the, the um, group of, of women who, um, who, who believe in them and also help to provide the, um, the, the things that they need, including, uh, you know, sometimes some, some uh, money to get home from college or to, you know, to, um, to do the things that are within the program that they might not otherwise have. Right. And Shirley has been really good with that and just kind of call her for just about anything. And between her and NAACP, Dennis Powell, they always try to make meet those needs. But just to watch people, we have um, younger girls now we call ambassadors. And the youngest that went to um, Accra with Ghana with us was, I think, eight or nine. But her mom came along because now they're called ambassadors and they're being trained up to be the next scholars is, is what we call our students. And then, um, yeah, to eventually become alums. When we watch these young women um, 
you know, just develop from being shy. They come to meetings and they don't have anything to say. And then they can run meetings. Like when we were in Accra, we had two alums with us from Howard University, one from Howard and one from A&T. And they were so instrumental in saying to the, the, the scholars, you know, I, that was me when I first came in. And that's more powerful than Shirley or I saying it, you know, that or any mentor who, you know, we have, um, we have doctors, there are two of us that are mentors right now. We have a therapists, we have social workers, we have teachers, we have, you know, all kinds of professions are in the group. So um, they get to see us, we're a little older. So the, the young people helping is very important. They can see themselves really reflected. They can see themselves one step down the road, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Two or three steps and we see the, we see the potential in them as soon as they arrive or they come through because each one of them have their own special nuances. And so we try to encourage them. But when they see others and others can come and tell their stories, that how we are. So we're getting ready to have our annual retreat where we meet and we do some team building. I do team building the first, um, we do Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and I do a team building exercise with them and we get going with the weekend and just begin to bond mm -hmm. so that next year when we um, will go to a historically black college and university tour, we, you know, we're, we're a cohesive group. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been just wonderful, Jean. I love, I love all that you do and, um, and the way that you bring your joy and your passion to others that you, know, that you have both received uh, the kind of support that you needed along the way, and then that you also provide that for a lot of young people, both through this program, Rope, and also through your work training social workers. Yes, that is so exciting to me. Um, I, I just feel like I bring a certain, um, a little edge around my compassion, an edge around being a female, an edge around being a woman of color, and an edge around being um, a, a woman from the Caribbean islands. One of my students last night, we were talking, and at the end I said to her, are you Jamaican? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, so am I. And she went, <laughs> she's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I am so happy. But because it's not in my bio, you know, that and she was like, I did not hear an accent. I'm like, it's really that people speak to me and don't hear an accent. She goes, I truly did not hear an accent. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine, so, too, how how connected she felt, you know, with, with this shared background that she wasn't even aware of. I mean, typically the students are that that I've met over the years since I've been there, they're Haitians or they're Africans and they're so excited. Like, oh, I went to my BSW and I never had a black professor. Or, I went to, you know, I'm so happy when I read your bio and see that you're black as I do a, a small a pictures and or a video. And they're they're so excited. But to meet a Jamaican and so then she said to me, Where are you from? And I says, I'm from Kingston. She goes, I'm from Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of like that's what I feel like I'm here for. I want to continue to motivate, you know, and inspire and, and and give back in some way because I do truly feel that a lot has been given to me. Yes, I've worked very, very hard, very, 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 very hard. <laughs> and at the same time, I've I've received a lot. And you continue to work very hard. Uh, there's a, a concept in the Bhagavad Gita, which is, uh, you know, one of the ancient texts from India, which talks about doing your um, your dharma or your passion full out. And mm -hmm. and and you are one of those people. You do it full out. You don't hold back. And um, and it, it comes through um, even in 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 every conversation I've ever had with you, because it, it comes through your being. Um, it, you radiate it um, and and you're inspiring that in other people, which is, um, you know, it's it's such important work. Um, I think you froze, Jean, um, but we are at the end and I do want to thank Dr. Jean Clark Mitchell for uh, joining and sharing uh, so much of, of her story. There's, I'm sure, 
so much more, but to share this amount um, and to get this out, this this uh, broadcast is really about uh, people who are living their passion, living their dharma, living what they're here to do, and um, uh, and 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 how that comes to be, how they how they happen to be able to do that, and in Jean's case. Um, Dr. Clark Mitchell's case, how she passes that on to others. So thank you all for joining the Inspired Living podcast today and look forward to seeing you again next week.